This week on The Local Show, unmasking Ebenezer Scrooge. We take you inside the City Age Summit as Mayor Sly James tries to save America's urban cities. And what next for the Kansas City Art Institute? We go straight to the top. And bridging the digital divide. Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Hall Family Foundation, Johnson County Community College. Additional support provided by and KCPT members. Thank you. to another edition of The Local Show. I'm Nick Haynes. And I'm Randy Mason. Randy, now Marley was dead. As dead as a doornail. Now this must be distinctly understood or nothing wonderful can come of the story I'm going to relate. Yeah, Nick reciting Charles Dickens. It must be Christmas Carol time again at the Kansas City Rep. Humbug. What's Christmas to you but a uh, time to pay bills with no money? A time to realize you're a year older and not an hour richer. Before you mutter humbug, we're joined by the show's most veteran star. He's been appearing in the annual holiday production for close to 30 years. You know him as Mr. Ebenezer Scrooge. Though his friends and family call him Gary Neal Johnson. Let's talk about, in a sense, what brings you here, which is, of course, a great history of doing shows at the Rep, but there is this one character that Gary Neal Johnson pretty much owns, and uh, you, you've come to it pretty honestly because when we talk about A Christmas Carol, and you doing it now for 12 seasons, there's even Christmas Carol before that that you played a pretty prominent role in. How, how did you get into that first, uh, that first wave of Christmas Carol? Um, I I saw the show as an audience member the first year, 1981. Before the next year, they called and asked me if I would do it. I played small roles. I was Young Gentleman and Old Joe. I think I've probably been the only actor double cast as Young Gentleman and Old Joe. Um, and uh, then as the following year, I think I was Marley, then became Charles Dickens, the, who, who is the narrator. Played that for 14 years and, uh, and then just graduated. Except for one year when they did not do a Christmas carol. Right, 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 right. Uh, Christmas story was done. Right, and, I, and I, they said at the time that the intention was to just do it for one year. It, they, were, they were not hopeful that it would replace Christmas carol. They always said, we'll come back to it, but we're gonna take a year off. And uh, I gotta tell you, that was, for me it was great um, because for the first time in however many years it had been up to that time, uh, but 25 years perhaps, uh, I had Christmas back. I had been, my, my, my Christmas, my family's Christmas is built around Christmas Carol schedule, which means every night I'm leaving at dinner time to go to the theater. So, so the, the year they did Christmas Story, which was very good for them financially and, uh, and uh, pretty well received, uh, was also good for me. Not financially, but, uh, but it was just great to be able to go see Nutcracker again. I hadn't seen Nutcracker for years and, and, and all kinds of Christmas activities that uh, I could do. You're actually almost still too young to play, to play Ebenezer Scrooge. As, as an actor, isn't that kind of a, a nice thing to be able to, to say and hear? Uh, oh, yes, it is very much so. Although, starting last year, they did say, Gary, would you mind not wearing the wig? And I said, well, how can I do Scrooge without wearing the wig? I'm too, and uh, they said, well, your hair's okay. And uh, so I ate my humble pie and went out there with my own hair. I'll tell you this, I, I, over the years, I now throw myself on the floor with um, a much greater care, and I'm much slower getting up off the floor when, uh, when, I, when I have to. I take everything a little bit easier. Um, and so I'm still alive at the, end of the, at the end of the show to fight another day. And you're gonna be alive at the end of the show only to turn right around and play yet another iconic Oh. A role on the stage, which is probably the first time that it's happened this dramatically, and that's Death of a Salesman. That's going to be, that's going to take a, its share of energy uh, as well, and it traditionally, too, is also 
played by actors uh, younger than Willie Loman is. You know, uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman, who is, I believe, 44, just played it on Broadway. Um, Lee J. Cobb was much younger. Uh, most of them are. Just so happens I happen to be, I happen to be about Willie's age. Um, but uh, I'll, I'll get through it, I think so. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, so very, very much. So, yeah, from Scrooge to Willie Loman, I guess you could throw in some Shakespeare if you wanted just to make the, you know, the, the, the <laughs> job even tougher with all the things. And then you've spent some time on Shakespearean stages as well. I have, yeah. Um, um, the, uh, the, the Heart of America Shakespeare Fes Festival, uh, I have done uh, quite a bit over the years. Uh, um, I've, I've had a connection with the Goodman Theater's uh, production of King Lear uh, over the years. Uh, I understudy Stacy Keach, uh, who plays King Lear, and I've gone on for him a few times. There's nothing like the feeling of being standing in the wings before going on uh, and listening to the announcement that, ladies and gentlemen, playing the role of King Lear tonight will be Gary Neal Johnson. <laughs> It's uh, it's disheartening, but you got to understand, you know, when every, every, everybody in the house is, oh no, you know, and uh, I say, well, but uh, it, by the end of the show, they, they've 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 had a good time. Well, I think it says the, the rigors of being a professional actor. I mean, these are the things you find the roles here, you take opportunities there, you take uh, you know take what what you can find, and then you go find other things, which obviously you've been able to do right, in Kansas right. City and and beyond. Uh, right, but, but primarily in Kansas City, you know, you you uh, you wait for the you wait for the phone to ring, and uh, if you're lucky, it does. And I've 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 been fairly lucky. I you know still can go stretches, uh, you know, with that work because there's only th so many theaters in town. Um, but uh, yeah, I've been, it, life's been good. Well, I know you need to get out and put up the Christmas lights oh, on the Johnson <laughs> family home, uh, which you only get so many chances to do during a busy season, right? Right, right. And, uh, uh, and this has been especially this has been especially busy time for me right now. So, in fact, we don't have a tree up. You know, what is it? Two weeks till Christmas. We don't have a tree. We don't have our Christmas lights up. And that, but that's just the life, really. Of that's my life at Christmas time every uh, every year. It's uh, uh, you know try to work life in around a Christmas carol. Well, bundle up and thanks. be careful on that ladder if you're <laughs> up there doing the lights. And uh, thanks so much for coming and uh, talking to us on you the local bet. show. You bet. Thanks, Randy. My pleasure. While we were busy with the KCPT membership drive last week, Kansas City Mayor Sly James was busy saving America's urban cities. More than a dozen U.S. mayors rolled into town along with political and thought leaders from around the country. They were convening at the Kauffman Center for the Performing Arts for the City Age Summit on the New American City. Kansas City is only the third place and the first U.S. city where City Age has held a summit. The first two have been in Canada. Well, the Kansas City event wound up attracting more than 550 people from 259 organizations in 73 cities. Producer Justin Bond eavesdropped on some of the sights and sounds of the two-day convention that included a nod to Kansas City's musical heritage. And so the music here continues, and I'm delighted to have you from all across the nation and beyond here in Kansas City to talk about building and rebuilding the great American and the new American city. It's a time for a national conversation about our cities. Kansas City is a special and unique place to have that very conversation. And you know, when you think about it, being a mayor of a city is a little bit like playing jazz. If you ain't got that swing you, and you can't collaborate, you ain't gonna get anything done. the federal government is pulling further and further away from their obligation, the state government is too. Local governments are now saddled with taking care of more and more of the infrastructure. I read recently 250 to 500 billion uh, is going to be needed to invest and replace infrastructure over the next five years in cities. What do we do about it and how do we pay for it? We look at every infrastructure project, every public sector project, 
as a public-private partnership in that there's always some private sector role, but I think it's important to think of um, both the public and the private being involved in every infrastructure project. Electrical substations, for instance, that are occupying very valuable city property can be restructured and built underground with current technology, and the land above that can be developed. That's to the benefit of the developer. It's tax revenues that the city didn't otherwise have. In these cash-strapped times, creativity is really the key. How technology is reshaping urban cities was another big panel conversation. Guests got to hear from the mayor of Chattanooga, which last year became the first city in the nation to offer one gigabit fiber to every home and business in the city. The future of cities is, uh, is dependent not just on infrastructure and quality of life, but on the quality of the individuals, the creativity, the smart young minds. And so the fiber, fiber to the home, has given us a leg up. Chattanooga has suddenly become cool. <laughs> again. Again, yeah. Not losing our youth to other places. An uh, elderly couple walks through the door at our retail space over on the corner of uh, Westport and State Line Road and just starts profusely thanking them. What for? It's our only son, who's 26, works doing app development in New York. Because of fiber, he's coming home mm -hmm. to Kansas City. From New York City. From New York City. This kind of connectivity is a huge advantage to communities like Kansas City, Chattanooga, uh, et cetera. Uh, sorry if there's anybody from New York here. It's fine. <laughs> we, yeah. we're, 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 there's one right here. <laughs> yeah, right. I get an email from a friend in Atlanta saying, you know, there's an article about what you're doing in Chattanooga in the Atlanta paper today. And I said, really? You can Google this. I think I can say Google here, can you I? can't. Yeah. It says, Chattanooga lures computer savvy professionals with cash. And this kind of gigabit talent is the future. Yeah. By the way, I don't believe gigabit is the end. We have some of the best photonics people in the world at Google looking uh, to ways to actually improve that speed, uh, 10G and, and, and beyond. Um, because this infrastructure we put in is not going to be obsolete. There's a crossroads where whether or not our infrastructure is going to uh, grow, uh, be able to be globally competitive, or whether or not the next set of startups, the next set of innovation is going to happen outside the U.S. in the Internet world. But rather than try and predict the future, uh, my goal is to invent it. The bebop jazz sound was born because of the jam session, which is exactly what this conference is, a jam session. It's great minds coming together to share, improvise, and improve. hotly anticipated high-speed network. But there are still lingering concerns about who will be left behind. A survey this summer found that a quarter of Kansas Cityans don't have broadband internet access at home. While Google is offering free internet service for a $300 hookup fee in those neighborhoods that are lucky enough to be part of its rollout area, that leaves huge swaths of the metro area without affordable service. Now Time Warner Cable is getting in on the act, announcing at a big press conference with both Kansas City mayors a less than $10 a month internet service intended for low-income families living in nine area school districts. We're excited about Starter Internet because we believe it gives students an affordable option, an affordable option that allows them to compete in school. Making the investment of this type benefits not just a few children, but tons of children will have access. About 85,000 uh, young people will have more access to the internet than they do today, 190 schools. It makes a very real difference. Time Warner's $9.95 a month plan will allow anyone with a child enrolled in any of these school districts and who's currently not a Time Warner customer to take advantage of the discount program. You have until the end of January to apply. You can learn more about the plan at thelocalshow.org. But we'll acknowledge that if you don't have a computer, you won't be able to check them. So here's the telephone number, 1-855-746-8700. And up next on The Local Show, we welcome Jacqueline Chanda. Don't recognize that name? 
Well, she's the new head of Kansas City's Art Institute that's been making news of late, and not just because it's eyeing up plans to open a downtown location. She's the 23rd president of Kansas City's venerable art school. Well, Dr. Chandra, when you look at your resume, we see these you know, references to Indiana, Ohio, California, but somehow or other, it always seems to involve a little France in the middle of it. Yeah. And that seems to be a recurring theme for yeah. someone who's covered as much ground as you have. What, yeah. what, what's the attraction? Um, I was a French minor uh, during my undergraduate years at UCLA and, was, and did a study abroad program at the University of Bordeaux my junior year. And that's where the love of France began. In September of that year that I graduated in 72, bought a round trip ticket mm -hmm. and $150 in my pocket and got on the plane and went to France to the dismay of my mother. <laughs> and that was the beginning. I mean, that was, you know, from then it was, uh, you know, I, I was there for seven years doing graduate studies. And then eventually, after spending about 13 years out of the U.S., came back home. Uh, and that's when I started my academic teaching career here in the U.S. And um, always had that little still fascination of wanting to go someplace where it was francophone. So I did a lot of research in West Africa, the Ivory Coast and Mali, and then eventually found this opportunity at, in um, Aix-en-Provence, which is where I was before I was hired to come to the Kansas City Art Institute. That's quite a circuit, and it does involve Muncie, Indiana, and, and yes. North Texas, and some places <laughs> yes. that aren't quite as alluring as uh, as France or West Africa. Right. Hopefully, Kansas City, <clears throat> we're going to put up there. If not, France itself is still a pretty good place for you to find yourself a year and a half in. I, I think very much so. I really like living in Kansas City. You when know, when I first knew I was coming or was in the interview process, mm -hmm. I was really interested in knowing about the typography. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to be any place where it was flat. Mm -hmm. And I needed to be some place where I knew that there were a certain number of sunshiny days. So I actually looked mm -hmm. up on the internet to see the number of sunshine days that you have in this area. And I felt comfortable. It wasn't quite like Tucson, but then it wasn't as gray as Columbus. And I thought, OK, this could be good. And so when the plane landed for the interview, um, as the taxi drove into Kansas City and I saw the river and I saw the typography with the hills, I said, you know, I think I could live here. <laughs> and it's really turned out to be a wonderful place to live. And it's kind of a milestone for us because actually the first interview on this show was done with Kathleen Collins, your predecessor. Oh, wow. She actually kicked the local show off uh, two and a half years ago. Oh, my goodness. So you're stepping in. You stepped into a situation that I'm guessing you found to be at least pretty stable after after her fairly long oh, tenure. Oh, yeah. She and predecessors before her had done a fa fabulous job of keeping the institution uh, in sound, you know, in soundness. And I really appreciate the work that she put into the campus environment because the beautiful of the campus was one of the things that she was very, very interested in taking care of. So I appreciate all that she's done in pa paving the way for me to step in after her retirement. I look at the crossroads and I think, could that exist if the Kansas City Art Institute had not populated uh, Kansas City with so many interesting people? My understanding is maybe, maybe not, but the lead was with one of our faculty members, um, Jim Leedy, who according to the history that I have, he was interested in providing uh, studio spaces, and so he bought a couple of old buildings and kind of somewhat renovated them, and artists started, you know, kind of occupying them in order to um, have studios to work in. Um, and and then things just developed from there. And, and I think it's really fascinating for me because the, the area of the crossroads from a, my understanding from a little bit of nothing has become now a central focus of the First Fridays. It's very vibrant, very rich, and of course now the property values have increased mm -hmm. tremendously, which means artists are now moving to another spot that will hopefully also be very as active as, active as the crossroads. And that area has actually apparently brought some interest from, from you and from the folks downtown about putting maybe uh, the Art Institute in play in, in, in that part of town. Exactly. We've had conversations about the downtown campus, which I know the downtown campus really basically focuses on UMKC's mm -hmm. um, con music conservatory moving downtown, and I understand that. But from my perspective, it's an opportunity to bring multiple entities um, in a vicinity where they can interact together and create a synergy mm -hmm. of thought processes between the artists, both visual and performing arts. So in our particular case, we're thinking of the development of a graduate program mm. and situating the graduate program 
in the downtown sector, you know, whether that's right smack downtown, whether that's West Bottoms, that has not been decided yet because we're just in the infancy, infancy stages of planning this uh, possibility. Yeah, but it's a pretty bold step for an institution that for so many years has been tucked right there in the shadow of the Nelson, and I right. assume that synergy has always been, <clears throat> been really a, a key yes. component. Yes, yes. So you start thinking elsewhere. Does that, does that challenge someone in, in, your, in your chair? Um, challenges on a I think on a good note, I mean, the whole idea is not to really mess with the integrity of our undergraduate program because that's mm -hmm. our strength. But I have, since I've been here, heard in meeting with a number of, of, of our alumni outside of Kansas City mm -hmm. as well as uh, in Kansas City to say, why don't we have a graduate program? And some who have said, wow, if you would ever get a graduate program, I'll be one of your first mm -hmm. students. So it, there's, there's, a, there, there's interest there, and there's nothing... I guess the closest one would be maybe Memphis or maybe it would be uh, Milwaukee. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's Chicago Institute, but we don't talk about the Chicago Institute um, because they're small. They're, they're much bigger than we are, so we only talk about those that are comparable, mm -hmm. let's say, in size or almost comparable in size. Um, and so it could be something interesting for us, especially as we think about it as not just a traditional graduate program in MFA, but something that is a little on the innovative, cutting-edge side, and we'll leave that part for future conversations. <laughs> Well, there's a lot of cutting-edge stuff that goes on with digital work, with, yes. with animators. Yes. It seems like, and Kansas City is yeah. proving to be surprisingly strong to a lot of people's uh, you know, uh, surprise, because yeah. there's more going on in this city in that way than, than you might know, and I would assume that's maybe some of the areas that you want it's to push. Some of the, I, I guess the whole idea is that this program would not focus necessarily on specific discrete disciplines, even though people may be interested in a particular mm -hmm. discipline. The intention is to kind of have it more open and also to couple it with notions of innovation and entrepreneurship. Uh, the good yeah. old entrepreneurship the part, which, old entrepreneurship, which, yeah. which is part of that artistic uh, need these That's days, right. is it not? But it's not only a necessarily a need, it's almost in some senses a natural direction for artists, be them performers or be them mm -hmm. visual artists. A number of our students who graduate become entrepreneurs, they start their own businesses, they, mm -hmm. they become creative in the way that they, they make that pathway to mm -hmm. something that, they, some place where they can use their skills to uh, better their lives and to better the lives of others. Mm -hmm. He's, uh, reference problem solving is mm -hmm. one of the things you really hope that the yes. other, I think most people think yes. well they just go paint or they no you know. our students are actually put in situations where a problem is presented to them where they have to find not just one answer but perhaps multiple answers to a problem so they say so they not only learn how to problem solve they also learn how to problem identify and and that that whole process is really, really important, I think, to our economy and the growth of the, of, mm. of the U.S. to have creative problem solvers who can come and find multiple solutions to a particular situation. And speaking of problems, I know front page news sometimes isn't always on the good good kind either recently. We've had some good stuff though. Well, you've had plenty of good stuff and I think <laughs> yeah. that's, it's, yes. it's uncommon to see uh, an article recently that mm. a building that you'd had a pledge made towards uh, not fulfilled and causing you to have to take the uh, the, the people who'd uh, come forward to court, mm -hmm. um, the, the Larry and Christina Dodge building, I guess mm -hmm. it is. What, mm -hmm. What's the state on that? Well, I really can't uh, respond to that this time because they're still in litigation. So I would rather not make any comment in relationship to that. Some of those tough days in the, the president's chair when you have to face that kind Some of stuff? Some of those very tough days in the president's chair, yeah. Makes it a little uncomfortable, but I think the uh, brighter sides of what we're doing and what our students are accomplishing and what we have to offer the community outweigh, you know, any of this other stuff that goes on. <laughs> One, I know you probably also spend, you want to spend some time sculpting. I think that's one of the things that you've been, yes. <laughs> been yeah. uh, known to do over time. Are you yeah. still getting some of that? Uh, I in? haven't done anything yet. Um, I spent a lot of time working on clay sculpture when I was in X, and um, I have a section of my garage where I've at least gotten the electricity done, so there's light there. I've had a new door carved so I can go straight from the house, mm -hmm. and the next feed mm -hmm. is to actually get a contractor in so they can begin to look at the space to create a kind of a somewhat studio space. It's rather small. It's like eight feet wide by maybe 16 feet long, so it's long and narrow, but it's just enough for me to be able to do something, be, have those creative moments where I can go. I think it's hard to find studio space in a regular home mm. or unless you go out and rent um, space, 
because I've always been worried about my floors. What if I drop paint? It's carpet here or there's wood and I don't want to mess it up. So I think the garage area will be perfect for me once I get it done. Well, rumor also has it that you've been known to be uh, out cycling from time to time. True oh, or false? Oh, yes. True. Very, very true. I enjoy riding my bike. I, I ride with a group that rides out of Brookside every Sunday morning, or at least when I can, when I'm here on Sunday mornings. And we do a good 25 to 30 mile ride, and I enjoy it very, very much. It's something I started oh, about six years ago in Arizona when I lived in Tucson. Well, and it proves that Kansas City isn't flat when you get out there. That's right. certainly does. Yeah. yeah. Dr. Challenger, good to have you with us here on The Local Show. Thank you. Thank you so much. And that's it for this week's local show. We'll leave you this week where we started at the Kansas City Rep, getting into the holiday spirit with a little Charles Dickens, a pinch of humbug, and some Yuletide merriment. It's a Christmas carol. I'm Nick Haynes. We'll see you next time on The Local Show. Ebenezer Scrooge, come forward. Come and know me better, man. What do you want of me? Much. Who are you? Ask me. Who I was. Very well, then. Who were you? In life, I was your partner. Jacob Marley. <laughs> Principal funding for The Local Show provided by Francis Family Foundation, Frederick and Louise Hartwig Family Fund, Kaufman Foundation, Healthcare Foundation of Greater Kansas City, Hall Family Foundation, Johnson County Community College. Additional support provided by and KCPT members. Thank you. <laughs>